My name's Peter Drake. I'm the provost at the New York Academy of Art, and tonight we are very happy to have Eric Fischel joining us. We all know Eric. He's been a friend of the Academy for over 30 years. He's been making important contributions to painting for over 40 years. He's in every major public collection and has been written about seriously for just as long. But things you may not know is he's really been a supporter of the Academy. He's um, provided, us, provided us with two of our most important alumni residency programs, and uh, he's been doing critiques here for at least 30 years. Um, he's also going to be our honoree uh, for Tribeca Ball this year, so please give a warm welcome to Eric Fischel. <laughs> I also want to start out just by saying a little bit about this exhibition. It's uh, called Collectibles, and it's for creative couples uh, and their collections. And so tonight, I'm going to start out just by asking Eric a little bit about collecting, you know, how he collected, why he's collected, how they share their collection. Um, so I just want to start out from the very beginning just saying, have you always seen yourself as a collector? As a kid, did you collect stuff? No. <laughs> Unfortunately not. I, I, uh, I, I actually lack that gene in a way, in, in terms of the obsessiveness. You know, the collectors have this obsession with either things or details or, you know, whatever. And yeah. Yeah, I don't. And do you think that's partly just because as an artist you're making your own collection? Uh, no, because I know a lot of artists that are obsessive collectors as well. But uh, no, I, d I just think it's a, a makeup, a, you know, personality makeup, I guess. Yeah, I remember myself. I mean, I didn't, I'm not a collector just by nature, but I remember having friends when I was little that were just obsessive about baseball cards and car stickers or, right. you know, Batman cards or whatever. But yeah, it's a gene. It's definitely yeah, a thing. Yeah, no, I, I, uh, the artist Armand was an amazing collector of, of all kinds of stuff. And, and uh, you know, like watches or swords or, you know, certain kind of uh, totems or it was just, and they, he'd just go through periods, one right after the other and just amassing this huge amount of, you know. I think I've always been just frightened of owning too much stuff, too. Yeah. There's something about that just turns me off. Yeah. But what, what do you remember? What's the first piece of art that you remember collecting? Jeez, uh, oh I have no idea. I, uh, the, the reason that I started to collect my peers was because I was visiting the Picasso Museum in Paris. And they had a room of art that he collected of his peers. And I thought, what a great way of sort of marking your time. You know, th this is who my competitors were, who were the people that challenged and moved me, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so I thought I should do that too, just for, you know, to, to mark the time as well. So I, I started to, uh, you know, collect works, you know, relatively minor works probably by uh, my people that I, you know, uh, was coming up with. And, uh, and that's how it began. I mean, I think you do see that in a, a lot of artists' lives. You see, you know, at the end of their life, <clears throat> you look at how they lived and there's just, at the very least, no matter what happens, and you know, you can have a great collection, whether you're trading with your friends or buying early or whatever. It's like, no matter what happens in your career as an artist, you can have a great collection. Yeah. Yeah, I think also it's, um, I, what, I, what I found was that it was easier, even if I couldn't afford it, it was easier to buy my peers' work than it was to trade with them. Uh, because you get into, you're going to give me that for what I just gave you? <laughs> you get, I mean, <laughs> what's that about? You get a cocktail napkin and yeah, I'll, I'll give you really? a paint. 
Yeah, so yeah, you get, you know, you buy the goddamn thing. It's a, you don't have to deal with your ego or theirs. But uh, I think that's easier when you're a student, right? Because you're sort of all in the same place. Nobody's really gotten, yeah, you know, a you market got. or anything right. like that. So it's almost like if you're a student, get that done early because past a certain point, it's impossible. Yeah. And, you know, people start saying, hey, wait, that thing's made out of stone and you're just giving me a canvas? What the hell? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just not fair. Yeah, it's not, yeah. Um, so tell me, if you're not trading with your colleagues, um, have you ever bought at auction or are you buying primary from dealers? And uh, from, uh, from dealers or in some cases directly from the artist. Um, but uh, yeah, I've, I've never done an auction. Um, well, you know, occasionally you do those paddle eight things, you know, where you see something and and do that, but in terms of actually going to an auction and stuff. Bidding. Yeah, not, you know, it's not, it's not like I spend a lot of money on, uh, on, on works of art, et cetera, so it's so kind of limited that way, too. Do you feel like you're primarily focused on your peers, or are you also open to, you know, looking at emerging artists, and are you still, are you still actively collecting? I, I uh, when I see something that I like, I try to get it. Yeah, and then it and it has that range from uh, uh, works by students that I see that I I want to encourage, and uh, you know I like what they're doing. I want to encourage that, and then and uh, works by. Uh, I I got into a thing where again I was in Paris walking by a gallery and that. There was a drawing in the gallery that looked like a Rodin, and uh, I, I you know, thought, "Wow, Rodin in a gallery, cool!" So I went in, and I, I couldn't believe how cheap it was. That just seems crazy to me. Like, how? First of all, you wouldn't even think they'd be available. Right, right? Well, that was the point. Yeah, it's like I didn't think they'd be available. There it was, and it was affordable. And of course, then I'm thinking. It's probably fake, but I can't tell the difference. So, so it's still maybe a good it's drawing. okay, you know. <laughs> you know, if it's not for resale, who gives a shit? You know, it's so I uh, I bought it, and uh, and then I I I started looking. What I liked about Rodin, what I, actually what I like about drawings. And with, with pencil uh, especially, I always like to um, sort of imagine where they're holding the pencil and when they're drawing. You know, there's a, there, each, each artist has a characteristic about their line. It comes from where they, how they hold the tool. And, and, and there's certain ones you can, you can tell they're sort of, you know, pulling it down or something or, or they, they have a you know a, a loose wrist or you know et cetera et cetera. Anyway, I li I like uh, trying to imagine where that is, and I found uh, with um, Klimt, for example, that he uh, I, 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 the only place I could imagine him making the the lines that he made was if he held the pen pencil loosely and sort of more to the top. You know, it was there was just something about that line that really attracted me. So, when uh, I had the opportunity, I bought uh, some Klimt drawings and stuff that, uh, you know, thrill me. And then, uh, and then I thought, I, I'll never be able to afford a Sheila. But I thought, no, I'm an artist, man. I could make one, yeah. right? <laughs> So, so there just happened to be a Sheila show up at Gagosian Gallery at the time. And I went up there to uh, see, to sort of look at it closely so I could really sort of see how to copy one. Oh, you were cribbing. Yeah, yeah. And, I, uh, and so I'm studying this line and, I, and what I saw was a person who could start at the neck, go down, to the shoulder, down to the outside, you know, the arm, go all the way down onto the fingertips with one line, and 
it a, a certain thickness was which was that he was certain starting here where he was going and yet the quality of the line he was nervous the entire way and i thought that combination of confidence and and uh, insecurity i could never duplicate you know it's like it's one or the other kind of thing but there's something about that hit that art, particular artist that I thought was extraordinary that way. It's, it to some degree explained some of the distortions too, you know, yeah. th that anxiety of just sort of not being sure where it's going to end. Yeah. And, and just the continuous just, line. Just as he's turning the elbow the corner, he's going, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> what I do? How am I gonna get to the <laughs> wrist bone? I don't wanna use an eraser. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no way you're going to use an eraser, yeah. <laughs> uh, so speaking of duplication, have you ever tried sort of copying one of the pieces that you bought just to sort of feel that touch? I, uh, I haven't uh, in a, any kind of disciplined way, no. Yeah. Have you thought about it, though? I mean, in the back of your mind as you're doing your own work? Yeah, I've, I mean, I've, you know, with the Klimt, for example, I've, I've dragged my pencil across a piece of paper, not, you know, doing a figure, but just sort of getting a feel for that line and stuff. And, yeah. But, uh, yeah. Well, one of the things that I like about the selection that you brought to the Academy is that it's so varied. I mean, it's clearly your peers in some cases, but are, there are people that are, you know, on the verge of being outsider artists and that the kind of freshness of that is really wonderful. The, the discourse that happens between them is really enlivening because yeah. of that. It's not, there's nothing that feels predictable about your collection. Uh, well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, um, there's a piece here the, down at the bottom of the three figures is by an artist named Wendy Arton. And I met her, uh, I was, uh, did a, two-month residency at the Academy, American Academy in Rome. And she was living in Rome, raising her children. She was married to a, an Italian guy who owned a bookstore. And she uh, had rented a studio at the Academy and was like every Tuesday holding figure drawing class, or not class, but figure drawing. She'd hire a model, you'd chip in, and you know everyone could draw. I hadn't uh, drawn from life in a long time and uh, was never very good at it or confident. But I thought, you know, what the hell? So I went and I'm, I you know, brought my pad and my charcoals and I'm sitting there and she's sitting next to me and the, mo the model is uh, starting to pose and, and Wendy likes to warm up with three minute poses. And so, go, right? And they, they, she, she also likes, in a lot of cases, more sort of, you know, bigger shapes and sort of athletic looking things and stuff, and you know, some bigger forms. Anyway, I'm, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm just trying to get going here, and I look over and she's done three of those. <laughs> in three minutes, I mean, it's like I'd never seen anything like it. She, she had such a, a grace and and uh, and you know such a, a confidence in light and dark and the anatomy of the body that translates into a flesh that it, that it was I, I just you know put it down I just watched I mean she was uh, you know really gifted at doing that so well, one of the things that's really wonderful about that piece too is that it looks so specific. It doesn't look like a generalized figure. It's like she's still capturing the person that's in front of her. Yeah, and she, she uh, you know, writes down the name of the, you know, this is Lydia or this is Ronald or, you know, whatever it is. It's always the person that she's painting that's specific to her, so. I'm curious. Um, it seems like there's quite a bit of water-based media in your collection. I don't know if you selected it specifically to reflect that or if that's just a characteristic of your collection that's interesting to you? The, the uh, is, I would say it's predominant uh, medium. Yeah, I, I, I collect drawings mostly or photography. Uh, very few uh, paintings. I have, I have some that, uh, 
you know, I like, but I uh, mostly collect, uh, um, you know, other things where, where there, there's something about the intimacy of it that I like to live with. And uh, so. I mean, I feel like a lot of artists in their drawings, that's where they're mo the most experimental, that's where they take the most chances, it's where there's the most freshness. And so works on paper, for me, feel that way. You feel like you're getting sort of the immediacy of the medium. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, I, uh, the, it's also obviously it can be incredibly expressive and stuff. The, I want to talk about uh, this uh, uh, black uh, drawing here of the face um, next to the clown. Um, that's a, his name is Mark Hemming, uh, dead now. Lived in Sag Harbor, I, I didn't know him. Uh, or anything about him. He, uh, he comes from uh, a New York Jewish Brahmin family. They, they uh, his name, he changed it to Hemming, but it was like Heimerdinger or something like that. And he, he, they were the um, uh, Rheingold beer fortune. And, and um, he was the black sheep of the family. And- uh, Because he was an artist? No, he wasn't an artist. Uh, he was, I don't know why he was a black sheep, but, but it was the kind of thing where the parents would, you know, leave him with a nanny and go off to the tour Europe for a month, you know, and not tell him they were gone, you know, that kind of shit. I mean, just anyway. But he, uh, he I met his daughter, who had that, at that time still lived out there, and we were talking about it, and at a certain point, he decided to take up art, and it became this obsession with him. We had a little studio, and he would work every day, and he never showed anybody, including his daughter. Like, he just, it was something that was so private to him, and he, he was so fragile around it. And it, it, it was when I heard the story of, you know, first of all, she was telling me about it and I was, and you know, wanting me to see the work because now she was in charge of his estate and was trying to figure out what to do with these, you know, thousands of works. Yeah. And I, I agreed to go see it thinking, oh God, this is gonna be awful. You know, a totally primitive thing or whatever. And his work is like, I think so expressive, and he captures people in this co very compelling way that uh, it made it even more confusing to me that someone could be that good at articulating emotion and not want to share it, right? Not want to pull people into the the uh, the empathetic experience and. I mean, it's like it, it totally bewilders me because my whole thing is to like make the work to get it out into the public to engage, a, you know, the public in some way. I mean, you'd think it'd be so frustrating to not, to, it's like you make a call and there's no response. You know, you don't actually get the other end of the conversation. Yeah, and, and also I, I lack the ability to understand how he would know whether it was any good or not, like individual piece to piece, like, does this work? I don't know, you know, it's like, how do you know unless at some point you start getting a, an echo? How consistent was he, I mean, of the work that you did end up seeing? He, 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 was, uh, he was very consistent, I would say. And it, right, it, was, it was all people and, and it was lo local people and stuff like that, he would, you know, uh, friends to, um, you know, bartenders and, and grocery store people in the town and whatever, and he'd go home and sort of remember them in a certain way. So he, so he worked from life, he worked from memory. Yeah, yeah. So even his sitters never actually saw it. So, yeah, saw the stuff, yeah, yeah, it was wild. Well, by sharp contrast, you've got a great Clemente I mean, I've seen a lot of his works on paper, and I think it's some of his strongest work, but that's an amazing painting. I mean, that's just a great piece. Yeah. 
I mean, uh, how, what made you choose that particular one? I, I mean, technically, it's kind of a marvel. I, I, uh, I think pro for that reason as well. I mean, Clemente's an artist that I've uh, admired all along. Uh, I, I think of him as, uh, as one of my generation's visual poets. And, uh, uh, you know, he, um, he's got this, I, I, I prefer his works on paper to his paintings. That I think the, 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 the faster the medium, uh, and in way, certain ways the drier the surface, the, the better he is in that regard. But uh, um, anyway, yeah, I think when you, you see these watercolors uh, that he does, they're, they're so masterful. I think a big part of it is just the paintings look too premeditated, you know, that the, there's something about when he works in watercolor on paper, that there's a level of spontaneity and just experimentation that you don't see as much in the paintings. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just actually, I was in London last week and I saw a show of, uh, curated of his drawings uh, from like the 80s to present. And uh, just, you know, one knockout after another. They, they were mostly uh, charcoals and, but uh, there's something, I mean, so compelling though. The, you know, it's, it's all about, uh, men, women, sexuality, desire, objection, that objection but also, uh, you know, a kind of a, a, a like spiritual elevation of this existential uh, struggle and uh, to understand the, the, the binary. And, uh, you know, they're, they're fantastic. And he spends quite a bit of time in India, doesn't he? Yeah. And I feel like some of the color must come from there because it's just so souped up in that weird, delirious way. Yeah, I, I don't know why. I, it seems like a lot of uh, people from Italy have a, a, a some uh, predilection. That's not predilection is a word I'm looking for, but they there there's some relation synergy between India and Italy, and I, I don't actually know what it is, but uh, yeah, Palladino's got a bit of that. Yeah. yeah. Just curious, this is, uh, I don't want to get personal here, but you're... Yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> how different is your taste from April's when it comes to collecting? Uh, well, she, she if anything that's got, like, something living in it is hers. Was the no, Alice Neal hers? Uh, <laughs> no. The, uh, uh, any, anything that's got, you know, sort of nature, animals, that kind of thing, her... She's predisposed to. Uh, mine's more people oriented and stuff. But uh, the Alice Neal, I mean, you know, I, w I would, I, I, I got that. But I would, any Alice Neal I would take. So it wasn't, you know, so specific to that. I, I just was able to get that. And we have cats, so it made sense. That, yeah. It's such a funny piece, though, too. It's a weirdly not Alice Neal and very Alice Neal at and the same at time. At the same time, yeah. 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 I and mean, the humor doesn't really play too big a role in your collection, from what I can tell. You don't but think so? One, well, the sim let's, pieces let's, are funny. Let's go <laughs> through and see what the hell we're talking. We got a clown. I mean, let's start with that. Clowns are scary. And then we got. <laughs> so, it's yeah. not fun. And then we got uh, somebody trying to paint a giant picture of Mao with all these creepy things hanging around. I think that's pretty funny. That's true, yeah. And, and uh, Lucy Winton and her dancing monkey on her thigh. All right, I take it back. <laughs> You've got a funny collection. Yeah, no, that, I, I think there's an edge to a, to a lot of it for sure. But, uh, and do you guys gift each other with art ever? Uh, you, but other people's art? Yeah. Um, Yes, yeah, I, I've bought uh, things, uh, mostly uh, uh, photographs, landscape photographs and stuff like that for April, and, and she's, uh, she bought me a Klimt drawing uh, once and bought me some other things. Any, any time, so either, <laughs> either that she bought something unexpected where you're kind of like, oh, honey, what, what's oh, going on really? here? 
Isn't knows this what? isn't this for your other Eric? Yeah, right. <laughs> Did you give this to the wrong Eric? Yeah. Do you know who I am? <laughs> yeah. Nothing like that. Yeah, no. <laughs> Have you ever had the experience where somebody gifts you a piece of theirs and you're kind of like, oh, thank you so much. That's really yeah. interesting. Really? Yeah. For me? Yeah. How well, could sure you? To get no, it seriously, how could you? Yeah. yeah. No, I, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, nobody's wandering around sort of dropping off uh, works of art at my door and stuff like that. But uh, I, I had, um, uh, we had a fire. Our, our landlord burned us out of our loft back in the mid-80s. And uh, the, the damage was done by the water, not by the fire. And it destroyed several works that uh, we had at the time. But one of the things is that when I came up into the, you know, smoke smelly, you know, water of three or four inches deep, things floating around kind of thing, there was this little painting I had of Ross Blechner's that had a um, tennis ball melted on it. And, I, and I, I love this little paint. It, it was just a little abstraction that was very provocative, uh, uh, you know, or evocative. I could never sort of settle on what it was, but it, it just kept me going, and which is a good sign of an abstraction, I think. But uh, and there's this tennis ball, you know, melted on it. Anyway, so I called Ross up and I, I said, Ross, uh, you know, your painting now has this thing on it. And I, I, I'd love to see if you could fix it and, you know, get that off of there and repair the painting. He's, he said, sure, bring it by, you know, I'll, I'll do what I can. So I brought it by and I showed it to him and he looked at it and he went, oh, I like this. <laughs> And I went, Ross, get the fucking tennis ball <laughs> off of the painting, will you? <laughs> Which he did, but... <laughs> He's a little perverse, thing. He's way. perverse, yeah. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about the Sim drawings. I think that's kind of... And how... Every, you must all have seen Sim at some point is, in your is life. Is Sim here tonight? So, we, if you want to speak too frankly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, if you if you have never seen or Sim Sim has been in the art world as long as I have anyway, and he's somebody that uh, you know very eccentric. He's got this sort of like Einstein hair thing and and uh, and wild strange clothes, and he, he's at every opening, and uh, he's he's you know sort of you you get a sense there's something else going on in his, in his life, you know, in terms of how he puts things together. And, and as he's the kind of person that, uh, uh, you know, people run away from. Yeah. So he comes towards you and you, f you know, find an excuse to, to do it, right? But, uh, you know, after like 30 years, it was sort of like, you know, he, he's still here, he's still a part of my world. And so I stopped running away. And so we just would chat and, and, uh, and whatnot. And, and he's one of these kind of extraordinary characters. He, he writes these poems that he recites that are very clever, very uh, complicated, language-based things that are very long, and he just rolls them off one after the other while he's talking to you. And I mean they're long, right? <laughs> and stuff, interesting sort of rhyme sets and things that, you know, not, not quite rapping, but I mean they're, they're, they go on. And, and he, he does sort of, he's a photographer and he, he does these drawings and uh, he started showing me his drawings and they're, they're all out of sketchbooks, they're all sort of line drawings like you see, they're characters he sees on the subway and he sketches them and they, they have a kind of wonderful observational uh, truth to them. He really gets a character, you know, and uh, he's somebody that you're familiar with and it's, you know, he's got an easy, sort of manner to it and stuff and 
He's somebody that uh, always needs money, and so every now and then I'll buy some more drawings from him. So it would probably most likely happen at an opening, because that's the only time I've ever seen him has been at openings. But it seems like he's at every opening. Like he's at every it's opening. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And it's been yeah. for years. I just feel like yeah. you go to the opening of a can of tuna. I mean, there's just. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, somebody, somebody said it, uh, th they saw on Instagram uh, a friend of theirs was taking samba lessons, and there's Sim in the middle of the photograph, so, so he even goes to samba. <laughs> he loves to dance, yeah. So um, I, I was surprised you, you were very pleased with the hanging that Heidi and I designed for your wall. And you said that when you, I mean, I've never heard this before, most people when they you know, get art, they're very particular about where they're gonna put it and what it's gonna hang next to and like how much space is gonna be around it, but it sounds like you've got a much more intuitive way to hang your work. Is that what you would call <laughs> intuitive? <laughs> yeah. No, I th first of all, we don't have any large walls. Um, you know, uh, we, d and we, we don't have a house that has lighting that is directed at the walls in a way that, you, you know, you can really highlight and feature things and sort of work uh, hanging around those lights and stuff. I mean, it's it's totally pathetic. But, so what we have is we have works that we like to live with and they're just everywhere. And, uh, you know, and, and so when you see them organized like this, you think, shit, that's what we should do. <laughs> Only we don't even have a wall that, that big to do it, so. I've actually known some collectors to, you know, build over their windows. Like they'll get to a point where yeah. they just, you know, they yeah. want more space. And it's like, well, I'm not gonna build another house, but I can cover up those windows. Yeah, yeah, no, it's I don't, true. You're not gonna do that anytime no. soon, yeah. No. What percentage of your collection do you think is up at any one time? Is it all up or do you have stuff in storage? No, we, we have uh, uh, things that are in storage and, and uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's not like it's a vast collection of something. Again, we don't have a lot of wall space. So. Yeah. I mean, I even find myself because of events here at the Academy and what Janice and I have so many small paintings from Deck the Walls at this point, which is great, they're beautiful, but you sort of have to rotate things yeah. at a certain point. And you realize that you know, there, you have these little gems and when you pull them out again, you're like, wow, man, I really miss that piece. Yeah, you know? yeah I, was, I was with a, um, a, a woman who runs the gallery that my show is at in London and She's a historian, a trained, you know, uh, connoisseur of, of where she really knows how to look at the object in terms of, you know, whether it's been repaired or, you know, whether, you know, that compositionally this one's as good as this one or, you know, there, she's, a, she's a connoisseur in that way. And so we were going through the auction house uh, the auctions are this week in London, and so we're going through looking at stuff, and you know, she's looking at this drawing going, see, they, they, they wash this one uh, to get the f foxing off of it. You can tell because blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, she was looking at another one and said, see, see here the way this, this Fontana painting is, is sliced, and you can still see the white of the canvas here, that's important because there were some that were painted over after he cut them and so you wouldn't see that white, da -da, you know. So they were she was looking at, intimately looking at the object for its authenticity, right? Which is a whole other level of, of sort of, you know, collecting and, uh, and observing and things that, you know, I, I have no skill set that way. I mean, if, uh, you know, if it turned out the Rodin was a fake, I deserve it, you know? <laughs> I mean, et cetera, et cetera. So. It is one of the weird things, though, about going to auctions that you'll find yourself, and this is true for certain private collections, too, where you just, you'll turn a corner and you'll see a monk that you feel like that should be in a public collection, you know? It's just startling how much great work shows up at auctions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's scary, you just feel like, 
this should be part of the public trust at this point, especially if it's been a hundred years or whatever. Well, the th thing that I am even more shocked by is how much more expensive contemporary drawings can be compared to the uh, drawings of the people that I admire, like a, like a Monk or a Rodin or a Klimt or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You just sit there and go, how, how, the world's upside down. Especially since you know it's a limited amount. Once somebody dies, they're not gonna be any more. Yeah, supposedly. and it's also a foundation. You know, it's, it's what we're standing on the shoulders of these guys. And, uh, and for, for them to be of a, of a lesser value, I, I just don't get it, so. Even though I'll buy it. <laughs> um, I'm curious, you know, you've probably been collecting for most of your adult life. Has your, have your collecting habits changed at all? Do you find your taste as a collector changing? as the art world changes? Uh, I, I can't, as, because I have no strategy for collecting other than like, oh, I like that, or oh, this is really good, and I want to help this person, or you know, with those kind of things. I, I can't really speak to, the, to that thing. So, uh, you know, if, if the art world, you know, the art changes, then my collecting changes by that because it, you know I'm looking at different things now. But yeah. I, uh, you know, have you found yourself collecting any one artist, you know, in more depth than others? Uh, uh, probably Ralph uh, Gibson, a uh, photographer who's a dear friend of mine and and uh, somebody whose work I hugely admire. And uh, he, you know, it's uh, his. He's one of these uh, artists that I I love because I can't I I I I can't find in myself where that place comes from that creates the work that he creates the the precision the beauty the clarity the unabashedly masculine the, you know all of those things that are I find you know compelling it and. Uh, you know, he, he gets in his work, yeah. Yeah. so yeah. Um, Plus, you know, photography, they make them like, you know, hundreds of them, <laughs> they just, <laughs> give me a bunch of those. You know. And <laughs> so, I'm, I think I already know the answer to this, but um, I'm assuming that social media doesn't, hasn't had a huge effect on your awareness of emerging artists or your collecting patterns or anything like that. No. I mean, people are starting to sort of buy and become familiar with artists through yeah. Instagram and whatever else. No, I, I know. It's, uh, I, I was over at Ross Blechner's uh, the other day and he had a couple of works by artists that he discovered on Instagram. And, uh, you know, they were interesting. Uh, I, I can't remember the two, two young women and I can't remember their names, unfortunately. but. Uh, one of them was this large forest painting, and uh, he was he was going on about uh, about it. And it was a, it's a really nice painting, really strong painting, great light. And uh, it, I, I look at it and I see that off on the one of the edges, the, you know, in this lush green summer forest, there's a fire. And so the, the artist must have been thinking of like the California fires or the Australian fires or something like that. It was kind of putting you right before the fire got to where you're at or something like that. Anyway, but it was something that was so understated that when I pointed it out to Ross, he had never seen it. <laughs> and, uh, and clearly he never saw it in the Instagram either, right? And so. Uh, that's a cautionary tale, I think, to some extent, that you know, the, the, what you see on Instagram can't quite deliver what the, the actual experience is. And you know, he, had, he, he, he didn't, like, all of a sudden not like the painting, but it changed the way he thought about it. Yeah. 
And that, that was surprising to him. So Was he embarrassed at all? I mean, it's one of those things. I where hope so. <laughs> yeah, it feels yeah. like. You should be ashamed you, of yourself. You that's a major part of the painting. Yeah. You sort of yeah. missed yeah. the idea. You missed the whole thing. Yeah. yeah. No, I don't think so. But, uh, but anyway, yeah, so people are, are exposed a lot to, to work. And I, I find, uh, I, I have an Instagram account. Occasionally I post work that I've done or photographs that I've taken someplace, you know. And then I, I never follow it. And I have followers and I never look at what they're doing. And I feel like a total egomaniac. <laughs> That's what Instagram makes me feel like a complete narcissist. Like, all I care about is uploading my own shit. <laughs> and it's like, and I think, that's, you, that's terrible. And so I, I try not to do that, so. It's like yeah. gay. What's that? All the time, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, But I understand there's a lot of uh, students who are, that they're receiving um, influence, like they're making Instagram art and stuff like that. Is that what you find here? I mean, there are people, I'm always amazed when a student will have 150,000 followers. I'm like, how does that happen, you know? Yeah. But uh, some people understand the algorithm, I guess, a little bit better. Yeah, but also I think there's a, a, a language that creeps in, not, not just to the how you mediate your work, but yeah. actually the, the language of making the work. Yeah, that it's designed you know, that for that system. It's designed for that, yeah. yeah for sure. It's, it's like there's a lot of art that is made for uh, selfies, right? You know, that's its attraction. It, it sort of gets you and you go, oh my God, you know, yeah. Um, do you have any plans to donate your collection at some point? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, uh, I've fantasized about, about that or about, uh, I, I think some of it would be interesting to do for educational purposes to, to sort of tour, you know, like school galleries, museums and stuff like that. Just so people can see the actual thing, you know, a, a, a real Klimt drawing or a real Diane Arbus photograph or, you know, that, all of that stuff. So I think about that. Then I think about selling everything and buying a sandwich. <laughs> you know. um, well, I'd like to open it up to the audience to see if there are any questions from you guys. Do you have any rules in your collecting? Like, only buy what you love, or from who you know, or rules? I, I don't think of them as rules, but I tend to sort of move along a certain consistent line. I mean, as I said, I started out with the idea of trying to get one thing from my peers. Right, so that marked the territory. And, uh, and then that expanded, uh, um, you know, affordability of things that I liked. And then, and then uh, you know, sometimes it, it stayed, you know, current and that I was looking at, uh, you know, some of recent graduates or, or whatever. And then sometimes going back in time, but uh, not, not you know, I haven't gone back to the Renaissance yet, but anyway, yeah. Try, uh, yeah, that's what I hear, yeah. yeah. You have a question? Yeah, uh, since you're an artist, what's your experience as someone who's working against the system? Can you say that a little louder? Um, what's your experience with people who collect your work? Like, do you have any uh, advice? Do I have advice to people who collect my work? More, collect more. <laughs> Call me shallow, but uh, yeah. no, I. Uh, you Instagram narcissist. You. I have. Uh, I have. I have uh, friends. You know, uh, collectors who become friends and stuff. 
and I have collectors that I've never met and, uh, and collectors that I've met but never talked to. But one thing is consistent, which is that I've never had a conversation with them about my work. Wow, that, really? That they've, they've never asked. Oh my God, that's so strange. Well, yeah. Were they just af afraid they'd say the wrong thing? Or? I have no idea. I, it, it's something that, uh, you know, you, you want to as assume that they're buying it for all the right reasons. But the, the truth is, y you, you know, having never had them say what it is exactly that, they, that brought them to it, that they like about it, et cetera. You know, I, I have no idea. I, I, it, it, and a, a lot of them have collected me in depth and, and they are consistent in that. So you have to think that there's a, 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 an admiration or an affinity or something. But in terms of actually articulating what it is, uh, I'm at Some of my favorite collectors are psychotherapists and they always want to talk about the yeah. work. It's such a funny thing, and they'll give you like their interpretation of your work, and, and they'll tell you you're wrong. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, uh, it's funny, to, I'm out at the Modern today wandering around, and this woman sort of gasps and goes, are, are you Eric Fischel? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> 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 Not really. <laughs> But I thought it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, she was a psychotherapist, psychoanalyst. <laughs> and she, she was like, you know, from Seattle. And she was like, oh my God, I, I love your work. I, I, you know, read and I look at your picture. You know, I've thought about that. You know, she would like, and it, you could see it was like she'd psychoanalyzed my work big time. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's a lot there, too, to yeah. tell you the truth. Yeah. But, the, uh, you know, the, the thing that is, um, I, I, people say, how do you know when uh, you're finished with something, right? How do you know when your painting's done? And I, I've come to understand that uh, the way I answer it is th there's a point at which I'm staring at the painting that I've made and I'm not looking at it as a painter. I'm looking at it uh, by a painter, I mean, I'm not looking at it going, is that yellow s strong enough? Is that edge sharp enough? Did I, did I you know, do this? That, you know, that's, that's me, the painter, trying to adjust and whatever. And then th there's a point at which I'm no longer doing that. I'm just looking at it the way I assume the audience is looking at it the way I want the audience to look at it, which is looking at it going, what is going on here? Who, who are these people? You know, why do, why do I feel this way? What does this make me re, re, you know, think about this? Or I remember something similar to, you know, all of those kind of ways that one attaches to a, a moment, an experience, a, a, you know, a, an image. And, uh, and so when, you know, people talk to, and they, that if they want to know what I was thinking, it's, they're disappointed in that, you know, I, I don't have the, the, uh, the answer. You know, I don't, I'm not the one that actually has the inside information on this. I've actually formed something through a set of intuitions and emotions that bring it into a kind of clarity for me that keeps the questions wide open. And it's the, it's the, the wide open questions that is where I want the audience to engage, right? So that they end up, it's an act of possession. They take it in and it becomes their work. So your psychoanalysts, uh, for example, that are, think your interpretation screwed up, you know, to some extent, they're, they've That's possessed right. your work. Yeah. So it's their painting, yeah. and, you know, they it's can... It's what you want to have happen. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Anyway, there's I a question a couple other there. hands. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I was listening uh, to your statement about life drawing in Rome, and uh, that surprised me a little bit that uh, you were saying that you're not someone who, who 
thinks of himself as using the figure to draw from, paint from. So in, 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 uh, so in, what do you, what, what's your process for? Yeah, I'm sorry that it, w it wasn't uh, that c clearly stated. The, I mean, obviously, I'm a figure painter. Well, I don't paint from life. And, uh, and I, I don't paint from life for several reasons. Um, one is, I'm not, I, I'm not interested in, in poses. I, I don't, I'm not compelled by that, and, and to sort of draw poses is too much work. You know, if you're not interested in what you're seeing, it's, it's labor. Uh, what I'm interested in is something that I actually can't tell the, the person uh, what I'm looking for. They have to show me what it is I'm looking for. And so how, you know, if you, if you hire models and you can't tell them what to do, what do they do, right? And, and uh, so I, I find, um, you know, first of all, photography helps tremendously in that regard because the, the camera uh, slices life so thinly that you, you get two things out of it, or you get more than two things, but w one of the things you get is you get people uh, unselfconscious. You know, they're, they're in between self-conscious, <laughs> right? They're moving from one self-conscious position to another, and in that split second, they're not self-conscious. They don't know where their body actually is. That's particularly true when you've used film or video, right? Because that's even more so. There's so many frames to choose from. Yeah. But the other thing is that everybody is in that split second off balance. And what I learned is that I to create a narrative, you need volition. Y you need something that where a, a, a movement is starting. You need to move it into time, right? Into a time frame. So to, to uh, capture somebody who's just beginning to turn can totally uh, activate a whole sequence of questions that, that ultimately lead to a uh, painting, a scene, or something like that. You know, you, you get into, you know, are they just getting out of the chair? Are they turning towards somebody that just come into the room? Are they turning because they heard something? Are they turning away from something over there? E each one of those questions has ramifications, right? It, it sets up a different emotional trigger, et cetera. It becomes so. a catalyst for projection on the part of the audience, too. Exactly, yeah. And so, so I don't. Now, the, the trick with... Uh, painting, you know, or the problem with painting from life or the problem with painting from photographs is with, with painting from life, you have an enormous amount of information at your disposal, right? And it, it's a natural inclination to try to capture as much of it as you can. Right, you can really be drawn into the challenge of matching, you know, color to light and shapes and and uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, those kind of details. And if you pursue that seduction, you ultimately end up with something that just looks like realism. You know, it's just this; it just is what it is, kind of thing. So for great realist painters, they have to know when to stop, you know, when to, when to let the, all that obsession with detail go. Or they have to dominate it in such a convincing way that, you know, it, it takes its own thing. When, when you paint from a photograph, the same thing happens. You're compelled by seeing as much as you can see. 
But the thing is, your source material is, is an abstraction, so you know, and it's, it's a reduction of detail. And, and if you pursue it in the same way of trying to capture it, you'll end up with something that looks like a photograph, right? So the, the thing for me was always trying to figure out how to balance what I need from a photograph uh, and what I don't need. And, and so that it, you know, it, it, it takes on its own uh, sort have, of ne ne sense of necessity, I guess. Have you ever tried to work with a, a particularly dumb camera, like a Helga camera or a Polaroid camera or something like that? No, I, I haven't. I, I mean, I'm a dumb photographer, so I probably made things that would qualify for <laughs> shitty, shitty references. But um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not interested. I, I'd like to have as much information as I can have and then let myself figure out what I, I want, you know, I, I, so. Anyway. I saw some other hands up there. So going back to collecting, have you ever had the one that got away? A piece that you saw and you thought about buying, decided against it, and it like haunts you? Uh, I, I, you know, I, I wish I could say yes in a, in a way that w made it interesting, but uh, but no, I, I, I really don't, I, I, yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 I don't have that uh, uh, particular drive to, to get the one thing, and, uh, you know, I mean, my, my collection's not going to go down in history <laughs> in any way that way, it's just going to be nice, you know. Do you and April have any of your own works in your collection? Um, you mean in our in our house displayed? Yeah. Yeah, we have um, we have uh, each have a, dr a painting uh, in the house. We we tend not to we we live in our studios most of the time, and so we live with our own work most of the time. So it's nice to get out of there and, and not have it be there. So uh, we don't, um, you know, keep moving our stuff through or have a lot of it or whatever. It's just, you know, there's this sort of one token Gornick, you is, know, landscape, one token official. Is there any, are there any pieces of yours that you would never sell? Uh, I say that a lot. <laughs> and it's not then true. It, and then, well, it de you know, it depends. I, I definitely have a price. <laughs> but uh, what I've tried to do, I mean, I, I couldn't afford to keep my work years ago, which has become the, probably the most sought after and valued of my work. And uh, so, but I couldn't afford it, so well, that's all gone. Then at a certain point, uh, when I could afford to hold back something, I, I started to at, at least keep one painting from each show yeah. for myself and stuff, and so that's, that's what I have. Uh, have you ever bought back a piece that came up at auction of yours? I, I bought one back, yeah. From the early years? Yeah, mm-hmm, yeah, wow. yeah. Yeah, not, uh, not one of the big ones, though, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately, but just something that... Uh, yeah, I have to say that the f I think the first show that I saw of yours was at Ed Thorpe's on West Broadway, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Was that your first show in New York? Yeah. That yeah. was such an amazing show for a young figurative artist to see. It mm. was just sort of like, what, you can do the figure and you can like talk about light and sex and all this other stuff, and it's just like... I, you can't imagine, the, you know, the effect of work like that on, you know, a young emerging community of figurative artists that had been basically marginalized forever. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, it was, you know, 
all the all the things lined up in a certain way that the moment was right for it. But you know, part of my uh, frustration, but also what turned out to be a blessing, was because I was not trained with any technical skills, uh, nor was I trained with historical uh, stuff. You know, the the school I went to was so about the new that they thought that if they with if they separated you from history you would make only new rather than repeat history <laughs> right and uh, and they thought if you if you wanted to reproduce uh, an image you could do it mechanically you didn't need to learn how to draw and stuff like that so they, I, I was an abstract painter in school and for a couple of years after that. Uh, I, w I was a really <laughs> shitty abstract painter. And, uh, and then I began to start to work with the figure and with narrative. It was when I discovered that I'm actually a narrative painter, not, not just that I'm a figurative painter, but that I, I tell myself stories as I paint. And I try to make that apparent to people. I tried it when I was uh, painting abstractly, but no one knew that that blue brushstroke was the uh, third line of this uh, song or the, you know, whatever that influenced my, you know, wh who knows what I was thinking at the time. But anyway, I um, completely forgot my point. <laughs> Sorry. Are there any other questions from the crowd? All right, let's call it a night. Thank right, you so thank much. You.